Hello again everyone, today we will talk about geodesics and minimizing curves, which are central objects in geometry. As always, we start with a surface sigma and take two points P and Q on sigma. We define the induced distance between P and Q, denoted simply by dPQ, as the infimum of the set of lengths of all curves between P and Q that run along the surface sigma. If a curve attains the infimum, then it is called a minimizing curve. That is, a curve gamma in a surface is minimizing if any other curve alpha with the same endpoints is at least as long as gamma. In general, if we have two points P and Q in a surface, this infimum is not necessarily attained, and if there is a minimizing curve between P and Q, it is not necessarily unique. We can observe this when we consider the surface consisting of the xy plane minus the origin. In this surface, when we look at the curves connecting 1, 0 and minus 1, 0, all of them have lengths strictly more than 2, as we know the only curve of length 2 connecting these two points is the straight line, which is not contained in our surface sigma. On the other hand, we can easily construct curves in sigma connecting P and Q with length arbitrarily close to 2, meaning that the infimum is not attained and there is no minimizing curve between P and Q. To see that the minimizing curves are not always unique, we just need to take a look at the round sphere, where any meridian is a minimizing curve between the North Pole and the South Pole. But we also have good news. If a surface sigma is a closed subset of R3, then sigma d is a complete metric space, where d is the induced metric we mentioned at the beginning of the lesson. This is an easy consequence of the fact that a Cauchy sequence in the metric space sigma d is also a Cauchy sequence in R3, and this left as an exercise. A slightly deeper result is the following version of the hopf reno theorem. It states that if sigma d is a complete metric space, then between any two points p and q on sigma, there is a minimizing curve connecting them. Now, the proof of this theorem is not that difficult, but is somewhat long, so we will leave it for a later lesson. Before we analyze how minimizing curves behave, let's take a look at the energy of a curve. If we have a smooth curve gamma, we define its energy to be one half of the integral of its speed squared. Contrary to the length, the energy of a curve depends on the parameterization one uses, but we can use this fact as an advantage. It is an easy computation to check that for a smooth curve gamma along a surface defined on the interval a, b, it minimizes the energy among all smooth curves defined on the same interval with the same endpoints if and only if it is parametrized by constant speed and it minimizes the length among all smooth curves with the same endpoints. As a hint, I remind you that by the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, the integral of f squared along an interval a, b is greater or equal than the integral of f squared over b minus a for each continuous function f and equality holds if and only if f is constant. Because of this, the problem of finding a minimizing curve between two points is closely tied to the problem of finding a curve that minimizes the energy among curves parametrized over a fixed domain with the same endpoints. Let sigma be a surface and gamma a curve in sigma. We say that a smooth function theta is a variation of gamma if theta of 0 t equals gamma of t for all t in the interval a, b. The curve v of t, given by the partial derivative of theta with respect to the first variable evaluated at 0 t, is called the direction of the variation. Notice that for each t, v of t lives in the tangent plane to sigma at gamma of t. A variation around gamma allows us to compare gamma with curves nearby specifically the curves that we obtain after perturbing gamma in the direction v. We say that a variation theta is proper if theta of s a equals gamma of a and theta of s b equals gamma of b for all s. A proper variation represents a family of curves near gamma with the same endpoints as gamma. This of course implies that v vanishes both at the initial time and the final time. Now let theta be a proper variation and let e of s be the energy of the curve theta of s t. We claim that the derivative of the energy with respect to s at zero is given precisely by minus the integral from a to b of the dot product between the acceleration of gamma and the direction of the variation. To compute this, we differentiate under the integral sign. 
We can do this as theta is smooth and apply the product rule to obtain the integral of the dot product between partial derivative of theta with respect to t and the partial derivative of theta with respect to s and t. This can be integrated by parts, as again by the product rule, the integrand is one term appearing in the derivative of the dot product between theta s and theta t. Since the variation is proper, theta s vanishes both at initial time and at final time, so the first integral is just zero. On the other hand, theta s is by definition v, and since theta is a variation of gamma, theta t t equals the acceleration of gamma, finishing our computation. This formula is telling us that if we perturb gamma in the direction in which it is bending, the energy will decrease. In particular, if gamma minimizes the energy among curves with the same endpoints, then its acceleration points at all times in the direction perpendicular to sigma, otherwise we could perturb gamma in the direction that makes an acute angle with its acceleration, decreasing the energy. A C2 curve gamma is called a geodesic if its acceleration points in the direction perpendicular to sigma at all times in its domain of definition. It is easy to check that a geodesic must have constant speed. A consequence of our previous computation is that if gamma minimizes the energy among curves with the same endpoints and same domain, then it is a geodesic. Combined with the previous exercise about energy and length, this implies that a smooth minimizing curve parametrized by arc length is a geodesic. Recall that if we are on an oriented surface, we have a Gauss map N. A smooth function that assigns to each point of the surface a unit vector perpendicular to the surface at the corresponding point. Now, given a smooth curve gamma parametrized by arc length, we define its geodesic curvature at the point gamma of t to be the dot product between its acceleration and the cross product between n and its velocity at time t. The geodesic curvature generalizes the notion of signed curvature for curves in R2 we discussed in lesson 7. It is negative if the curve is bending right, zero if it is going straight, and positive if the curve is bending left, when seen from the tip of n. A curve is a geodesic precisely when its geodesic curvature is zero at all times, just like a planar curve is a line if and only if its signed curvature is zero at all times. This is why some people, including me, say that geodesics are the straight trajectories in surfaces. Motivated by what we saw with directions of variations, giving a curve gamma on a surface, we say that a curve V parametrized over the same domain is a vector field along gamma if V of t lies in the tangent plane to sigma at gamma of t for all times. Notice that if V is a vector field along gamma, its derivative V prime of t is in general not a vector field along gamma. However, if for each time we project v prime of t perpendicularly to the tangent plane at gamma of t, it will be a vector field along gamma, which we call the covariant derivative of v, and we denote it by dtv. I leave you to verify that at each time the length of the covariant derivative of the velocity of a smooth curve parametrized by arc length coincides with the absolute value of its geodesic curvature at each point. Because of this, we think of the covariant derivative of the velocity of gamma as the acceleration of gamma relative to the surface sigma. Also, a function v that assigns a vector to each point of a surface is called a vector field as well if for each point p in sigma, v of p lies in tp sigma. If we have a parametrization phi from a domain u, then along the image of phi, v depends on u and v, and we can define the covariant derivative of v with respect to u at a point p, denoted duvp, as the orthogonal projection of the partial derivative of v with respect to u at p to the plane tp sigma. The covariant derivative of v with respect to v is defined analogously. If one also has a curve gamma of t equals u of t comma v of t, then the covariant derivative dtv at a point is given by u prime duv plus v prime dvv. This is a consequence of the chain rule and the fact that the orthogonal projections are linear maps. We are almost ready to obtain the geodesic equation. We only need one more piece. Given a parametrization phi, we define the Christoffel symbols with respect to phi as the coefficients of the covariant derivatives of phi u and phi v with respect to u and v 
expressed in the basis phi u and phi v. We have a total of eight Christoffel symbols. The ones represent u, the twos represent v. A Christoffel symbol is read as follows. We read first the numbers below and then the ones above. For example, this is the Christoffel symbol 212. It represents phi v component of the covariant derivative of phi u with respect to v. Because phi u v equals phi v u, the Christoffel symbols don't change if we flip the numbers below. So in reality, there are only six Christoffel symbols. As we mentioned before, a smooth curve is a geodesic if and only if the covariant derivative of its velocity is identically zero. Putting this in terms of u and v and expanding using the product rule, we get the following. Then we expand this expression using the definition of the Christoffel symbols. Since the vectors phi u and phi v are linearly independent, we can group all the coefficients of phi u and all the coefficients of phi v and each will be zero, obtaining these two equations, which together we call the geodesic equation. This is a linear second order ordinary differential equation with smooth coefficients, so standard existence and uniqueness applies. Take a parametrization phi and let p be the image of zero. Then there is an open neighborhood A of zero in R4 and a positive epsilon such that for each u, v, a, v in A, there is a geodesic gamma u, v, a, v with initial position phi of u, v and initial velocity a phi u plus v phi v defined on the interval minus epsilon epsilon. Moreover, the point gamma u, v, a, v of t depends smoothly on all five variables u, v, a, v and t. This implies that if we fix an initial position near p and an initial direction that is small enough, then there is a geodesic with such initial conditions defined on the interval minus epsilon epsilon. At each point p of sigma, there is a ball b in tp sigma centered at the origin and a map x from b to sigma such that x of v equals gamma v of 1, where gamma v is a geodesic with initial position p and initial velocity v. Moreover, x p is smooth and its derivative at zero is the identity map from tp sigma to itself, so by the inverse function theorem, this is a parametrization provided b is small enough. This map is called the exponential map at p. The following proposition shows that the exponential map is uniquely defined. It is an advanced exercise for the ones who feel comfortable with ordinary differential equations. For each v in tp sigma, there is an open interval i containing zero and a geodesic gamma v defined on i with gamma v of zero equals p and gamma prime of zero equals v. Moreover, if there is another geodesic alpha defined on an open interval j containing the identity with the same initial conditions, then j is contained in i and alpha of t equals gamma of t for all t in j. Another way to state this uniqueness is saying that geodesics do not branch. Using this proposition, it is quite easy to show that the exponential map sends lines passing through the origin in tp sigma to geodesics passing through p in sigma. To finish this lesson, we mentioned the second part of the Hopferino theorem. It turns out that for a surface sigma, the metric space sigma d is complete if and only if, for all q and sigma, the exponential map x is defined on tq sigma. And this happens if and only if there is a single point p for which the exponential map is defined on tp sigma. Again, this is not very hard to show, but the proof is long and technical, so we will leave it for later. Recall that by the theorem we mentioned at the beginning, all these equivalences hold provided that sigma is a closed subset of R3. And that's it for today, see you next time.